we can't look at this whole property. He owns almost 300 acres. Um, if I was going to scout this whole property, I think uh, the way I would speed scout it is, is in the spring like this, is I'd walk the whole leeward edge right where the land drops off. What, kind of what we're going to look at, but we're going to look at little spots of it. So we're going to kind of highlight some, some areas. And basically, if we walk the whole property, it would just be a repeat of what we're looking at over and over again. So we're going to look at that and then go back and, and look at the maps. Um, so uh, how many of you guys are uh, hunting private property in the hills? And the rest of you are on public mostly? Okay. So um, this is where I'm going to start. I kind of like this little knob that's in here. Um, one thing I noticed right away, and Mike, you mentioned it coming up here that you needed to improve on that, is that uh, the woods is pretty mature in the bedding areas which uh, I think this property, looking at it, could hold a lot more deer, and a lot of the deer in the area would come here if it was thicker in the bedding areas. Um, so we'll discuss that a little, um, which might not be as of interest to you guys that are in public, but you'd know what to look for when you're in public as far as thickness and stuff based on that. Um, but we're gonna go in here and look at this. There's a little knob that comes off of here that I really like, but once again, it's not very, thick and deer can kind of see out of it and uh, I want to talk a little bit about how you'd set up on stuff like that and set it up for hunting and uh, then we'll move on from there. Um, this, this is really going to be more question based for those of you that haven't been on these before. So uh, the questions usually bring out the best in this event. So I really encourage anybody that's thinking something or has something on their mind to just spit it out because that gets the ball rolling and uh, and from there, anybody got any questions? When you say leeward side, is that from the predominant wind? Correct. So, so now anything where the wind's blowing, it could be, you know, an east wind one day. So that would make, you know, west hill leeward. But uh, generally, when we're referring to leeward hills, we're referring to the ones that are on the downwind side. So generally, we're talking about the ones that face east, you know. Um, deer, deer prefer to bet on... Uh, downwind hills you know so wind blowing over like this they've been on this knob you know if it were blowing that way they'd probably go find something over on that side now that's a general rule and it seems to me that the more mature the buck the more they follow that rule and does don't necessarily follow that rule they'll bed in groups like in a circle fashion and they'll bed up a little higher and all look a different direction and watch out for each other where bucks are solo animals so they're more worried about themselves so what they do is they'll go down on a knob like this and they'll get to a point where this wind coming over, they're facing down the hill, but they can smell the whole hilltop. And they can see down the hill. And there's also a thermal rise in, in, during the day. And they'll bet about where the thermal rise meets the wind that blows over. And um, what we use is milkweed a lot in, uh, to check thermal currents and stuff. And if you drop milkweed up here, you'll watch it float to the point. And there'll be a point where it kind of tumbles because of that upward thrust of, of wind. Now, today's a pretty cold day, so we probably don't have a lot of thermals. But uh, you can kind of see what I mean when you see exactly where the buck beds are when we go look at them. They're right where that land starts to curve over, where that thermal stops and the, the wind stops. Any other questions? So sunlight really doesn't matter then? You're saying where the direction of the sun, you know, they like lay where it's warm, don't, that don't have no I really don't, I don't really think that has much of an effect. Um, I think it does with does and stuff. Um, but if you look, most of the time they're, they're in a cold day. They're on a, a, a south facing slope, which would be what wind? North. Leeward. Yeah, it's leeward. So it kind of double effect. Anything else? I got a question um, when it comes to thermals and uh, hunting them, you know, if you can't go into a spot, tell after the ground warms up. Sometimes when it's overcast, sometimes when the sun's directly out, it's hard to just get that perfect time to know when I should go in, when that is taking. Yeah, I'm usually checking my way in. Okay. So, I mean, you're talking about when you're uh, going to slide into something in the evening and you're waiting for a thermal change? Yeah. That's a pretty close window. You almost got to have a preset stand because that you only got like a half hour to an hour, depending on the terrain and where the sun is, of, of change before closing time. 
Um, but it is the window that they move in. If I have to hunt in that manner, I'll go in and I'll check the wind with milkweed as I go in, and I might sit back for a little bit before I go in and get there early on purpose, a little early, and just keep checking it until the wind changes. The trouble with that is, is it can be shifty. It is kind of risky to hunt in that manner, but it can pay off, as you're alluding to. On that note, would you be better off on the ground then? You, you might be because of how fast you got to get in there, right. correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hate being on the ground in hill country because you get so much swirling, but it might be better. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you see that day when the sun crests like the sun was setting? The second that sun disappears is kind of when that thermal changes? Pretty much. Yeah. And that's why it changes uh, from like a half hour to hour because of how the hills block the sun. Um, but yes, when the sun stops shining on that, it's not as instant as a light switch, but it's pretty quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's always my indicator. Yeah. It's, as soon as that sun disappears, it's different. Yep. Anything else? Okay, let's take a walk in here. Hopefully we can all fit in here. But, uh, <laughs> beds are. You can kind of see them right here, right? This one's got a stick laying in it. But there's also another theory, a series of them right where the next knob drops down. And that's the same deer. They'll move up and down based on the thermals. So they'll move during the day. But it's a short distance they'll move around in here so you know you look at this and you think well how the hell would i kill them right so and, and me and mike were just talking about that so for me i don't think a, a mature buck is even if he's bedding here he's not coming walking out too much in broad daylight most of the time i mean you get some exceptions in rut and i do think that owning this property you do not want to hunt aggressive all the time as I'm sure Mike and Eric will tell you, that that kills your property pretty quick. But the one or two hunts of precision moving in is usually what kills your buck, is just having the timing down correctly. So if and when I was gonna hunt this, and it was my property, like it is Mike's, I would probably leave this open. They like to have a view downhill, but they like to have thick cover to their back. And I'd probably try to clear some of this stuff out and let it come in thick. And, and all the way around so that they can't see the fields and stuff. They can't see what's above them. And my setup would probably be, I don't think these deer are going to come straight out. And the trails kind of show that. They're going to come out on angles. And they're going to go around that ravine, right? If a guy got up by like them pine trees and got a little around the corner where he could shoot over to the side, your thermal would drop right down that ravine and never get over here. So your evening thermal and your daytime thermal would go up. So the deer would never get your wind unless it was blowing from over there to here, which you're waiting for a wind blowing this way to hunt this. So I would be right in there, but I'd thicken it up in between. And obviously you're not gonna get away with too much late season, right? But it would be a good early season hunt where you could get in there and if you, had, if you could slip up right from the field edge and add shooting down into here to the trails that go around that corner, I think you'd do pretty good. But you can't over hunt something like that. You can only hunt it every, you know, here and there, maybe three times a year, and use your less aggressive stands the rest of the time, like maybe over food plots and stuff like that, and use your timing. Now, one thing that works really well in a property like this is if you've got a tight pinch like that where they're coming around, is to have a cell cam there. Then you know your timing. And if you, you know, you can't afford to have a cell cam in every spot, a trail camera for a season, because the timing will, will repeat itself year after year. So you can, you can have a camera there for a year and have a log, and now you know the timing for this spot. I really find that these uh, bedding areas, and the more I, I check them with cameras, you really get peak periods of uh, bedding there that's like a two-week period that's really, that's when the big stuff is there. I don't know why that is, but I've got certain areas that I know the first week of October are really hot, and i got places I know that the first week or the last week of October are really hot, or the first week of November, or, and it varies. You know, sometimes uh, first week of uh, season, like uh, like in my marsh hunt uh, this last fall, I killed that buck because I figured out where he was bedding the first week of the season. Um, so a uh, setup up on that hill would drop your thermal right down this, this channel when it would drop in the evening, and it would rise in the day, 
you shoot the deer when they come around the corner. You'd be close enough to the bedding that you'd get daylight movement. I think that's a good setup. Anybody got any questions on this spot? When you say Dan, how thick would you make it as far as you can't walk through it? Or is that too thick? Well, I think up on the top here. Can you repeat the question, the, the question was, uh, how thick is too thick, kind of, and how thick do you want it? I think uh, you've got to have some, some trees because they won't bed in open sun. So you've got to have some tr cover, but having a thick mat of brush, I don't think it can be too thick because you want them to go that way. You don't really want them to go up there. So I don't think it can be too thick, and I think uh, thick ground cover also adds food. I think people don't realize how much deer browse on uh on this stuff you know so a thick cover up their briars and stuff they love that stuff to eat it uh, i would rather they can't get through up there and they go through this way but you you can't just take the whole knob off and make it all thick grass because they do want some leaf cover if that makes sense anything else so dan so a lot of the public you know say that's a out there so mm -hmm. this would be public that's private say that field sure. private so you're having to come up from the bottom mm -hmm. So is that something where you would come, maybe you'd side hill in? You wouldn't come straight up into that spot, would you? Yeah, I would kind of watch because the deer watch downhill. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would be taking a look at how the deer, you know, are bedded, what they can see, what they can smell, you know, how's the wind going to go, how the thermal's going to go, and I'd find a way. I mean, in this particular case, uh, if I had to come in from there, I'd probably try to take the edge of that field right on the border, if that field was private, and slide in quietly. I mean, being, um, being that it is all private, it would be a lot better to just come in from the field and straight up a tree. But I think you could come along that edge pretty qu pretty quiet if this was covered in leaves. You know, late season's a whole different ball game. In that scenario, would it be better to hunt this in the morning versus the evening? Uh, maybe, yeah. Um, what I find in the morning, though, is a lot of times the deer come in from downhill. Um, they'll circle to the downwind side and come into the bedding. So a lot of times they'll, uh, they'll drop in and come in like this, and then you're sitting over there and you can't do nothing. And when you get down, you bust them. Um, unless they got good cover and you can sli slide out easy. But then you probably don't even see them come in. But they like to come in and uh, smell the, the, the wind coming over because you got the dropping thermal. Everything's going downhill in the morning. And they come in and smell the beds before they come into them. What's different though is they don't necessarily do that in the evening. In the evening they get up and just leave and they leave on the heavy trails. Um, that's not to say all deer do that, but I'm noticing that the bigger bucks come in from downhill and hill country. Um, downhill which is downwind. And come in, they walk up into the bed, turn around, and watch their back trail. What is interesting is you don't see a lot of rubs in these areas. I see one rub down there. Um, a couple of historical ones. And what that tells me is it's not holding a lot of bucks because they will compete for these areas. And if this bedding area was holding, say there was four or five big bucks bedding in this area occasionally, there'd be rubs all over the place because they'd be telling each other, this is mine. It'd be territorial rubs on the trails coming in around and especially right into beds like that rub down there. Um, so that right away tells me there's not a lot of bucks bedding in this spot. Like I said, if it had thicker cover and it was better, I think you'd be holding more bucks on the property. I think they'd come in from the neighboring properties and stay here. Fix it, enhancing the terrain would help you tremendously. So what would you put there to thicken it up? Like what? I would probably uh, just clear some stuff out and let some sunlight hit the ground. So I'd take out some of the crap trees that are up there that ain't worth much, probably the poplar and stuff, and uh, just let some sun get in there. Um, mainly just right over the hump kind of but i'd probably try to thicken this up a little too just because if i was going to hunt up there i wouldn't want the deer to be able to see me kind of thing have a little bit of cover there Good hinge cut. when you do get it thicker in here how close do you find the bucks to get to that that thick edge um i feel like uh, bucks have like what i would call a safe safe zone um what i mean by that is when they're sitting here now this is obviously I don't talk to deer, so this is what I think. But I think that they have an area that they think they can hear or smell or see anything around. And I think a mature buck that gets to be, say, five, six, seven years old doesn't want to get beyond what they know is safe in daylight. I think they got a leeriness of it. So I think they'll go up to the edges. 
you know, like the edges of the fields kind of thing and, and hold up. Now, obviously there's exceptions or nobody'd kill a deer, but I think for the most part, most days, that's what they do. And I know that a lot of the big bucks that I've shot, the older class ones, I've shot at closing time and I've watched them come out of bedding areas or heard them come out of the bedding areas an hour before dark and it just takes them that long to get 75, 100 yards. Um, most of the ones I, uh, I have killed that are big are in scenarios like this where I'm really close to them. Now, take that with a grain of salt. I'm hunting mostly public land and pressured bucks too. It's a little different. Um, bucks up here probably haven't experienced the pressure that they've experienced in some of the properties I've hunted. Um, so they're a little more easy about going far, but I do think that, you know, even some of these deer are pretty smart when they're older, as you'd probably agree with. So um, when you get that close, you're putting your yourself in the game for every buck. You're not just hunting the ones that will go further. You know what I mean? And I want to be in the game where I'm not closing out a certain portion of the deer I'm hunting, you know? I think every deer that lives here will get that far. You know, that's 75, 100 yards in daylight. Anything else? If you had a pretty steep hill mm -hmm. and there's a shelf down there and the other bend down there, would there be any situation where you would hunt above that in the morning? Uh, yeah, there, there could be. I just have to look at what the wind's doing, what the thermals are doing. Um, Northwest wind would be on the east side. As long as the thermal ain't dropping down to there, I mean, I can get off on a side and get it to drop a certain way. I'll look at things. Kind of like I'm looking at this. I'm looking at, well, how can I get the, how can I hunt this? Well, I can get the thermal to drop down that terrain. You always got to take uh, thermals into effect in hill country. That's the big thing. That's more predictable than the wind. Wind will shift around and stuff. The thermal is pretty much on the money. When the sun goes down, it drops. When, before the sun comes up, it's dropping. And it'll drop downhill as if you poured a glass of water on the hill. So if you imagine what you did if you did water here, it's going to kind of run down and go towards the, the contours. yeah, the contours, and it's going to follow them down. So if you're up there, it'll come down towards the deer to feel like it's blowing right to them, but it's literally going to hit that channel and go down to, down to bottom. So I'm always thinking about those thermals when I'm setting up, and you have to think about what the thermals are, are going to be doing when the deer come, not necessarily when you're climbing the tree. So you really got to worry about winds in, in uh, several ways here. You got to worry about what it's doing when you set up. You got to worry about what it's going to be doing when the deer get up to move. And you got to worry about what a thermal's doing and what the actual wind is doing. So there's two different wind directions and they change based on the sun. So uh, that's what makes this a lot more challenging than other terrains. So you kind of got to get really good setups basically. But you can do that but it is hard to do that in your manner. I think it's harder to do it in a small valley. Getting your wind controlled in a valley is really hard. On the hills, you can kind of look at the thermals and you can predict it really well. In the valleys, it swirls around like crazy. Anything else? Yeah, this isn't necessarily a question, but I would imagine we're kind of going back up to the field here and coming around. Could you take this trail out and show everybody what tree you would pick on that setup on the way out? Uh, I actually think I'd probably be up in one of them pine trees. Um, we could look at the trail coming out. We'll look at one on the next point. Um, but I think coming in, we kind of looked at the, the trail. So let's look at the one on the next point, if that's okay with you. And we'll look at how that one comes out. Um, and it's, it's fairly similar. You always prefer to come in from the top? You don't like to come in from the bottom? Or well, I prefer it, but... Uh, uh, a lot of cases you do have to come in from the bottom. Some people have just bottom axis. Um, a lot of the public I hunt, I hunt uh, mostly around Richland Center, Sauk County, places like that. Most of it, for whatever reason, has bottom axis uh, in this area. Now, when I went out to Ohio yet, last uh, fall, everything was from top axis. So it changes, but the bottom axis is tricky because, uh, yeah, visual, the, the swirling, all that kind of stuff. Um, I find a lot of the deer uh, in the areas I hunt, and we'll get into more of that when we get by Eric's place, a lot of the deer will bed right above your access or above where people park. Um, there's one place where I, uh, I hunt, it's 400 acres of public in, uh, near Richland Center, and uh, where I park and go in, the biggest bucks on that property are always right above the parking spot watching everybody park there. And I literally got to walk way out and around and come back and, and uh, take this long walk to hunt them 
150 yards from the parking lot because otherwise they'd watch me walk up to the tree. And uh, we've killed some nice bucks there. So uh, you got to think outside the box sometimes. Anything else? Okay, we can uh, keep walking. We'll go around this ravine and down this point and then move on from there. So uh, when I saw this uh, area, I really liked it a lot. It uh, looked like the best stuff I saw in the property, really. Um, as you notice, as we came in here, we saw a little more and more sign as we got closer to the tip. So there's a pecking order. This could hold a lot more deer, but I think the bigger bucks would be right near this point. Maybe the younger or less aggressive stuff would be up higher. Doles maybe up on the top. It's a nice long point that can hold a lot of deer. It gets it in a ways, and uh, it's got a predominant wind blowing down it. Um, so you can see there's some pretty good worn in beds down in here, sitting off the tips. And you don't see a lot of rubs right here, but as we were looking out, I mean, going out of here, you see a few really big ones coming in and out in different spots. Um, and a lot of historical rubs that tells you that something's been going on here for years. So, do you have any history here, Mike? Yeah, we've got a number of deer in here, actually. Oh, and, no. and, and right over there, too. Any good ones? Decent, yeah. 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 So over here, that's, I'm curious to that. They're dropping through and... I, well, I think they're coming around or dropping through. I've seen them both, both okay. ways. So uh, I would definitely throw some hunts at this. Um, and uh, I kind of want to walk you through how I set this up. Because I think uh, people find spots like this, but how they hunt them is you know directly inclusive to whether or not they kill stuff so obviously this is holding deer a lot of times of the year you know yep. um you can see there's uh beds in here all over the place big turds they're spending a lot of time in here anytime you see a lot of poop on the ground deer are spending a lot of time in there if your bedding areas don't have a lot of poop there's not deer there a lot because they they'll get up and move around their bedding areas quite a bit so I tend to, when I look at an area like this, this point, not really look up at the top, I'm looking at the sides. I'm looking at where it drops down and I'm going to follow the sign in and out and I'm going to go two different ways. And the first thing we're going to do is follow it this way along this, this edge and look at where they finally go out that way and then we're going to go this way and look at where they go out that way and determine a couple setups. One setup over here, one setup over here and how to hunt these deer based on a you know, just off wind, because you're going to be bedding here when the wind's blowing wrong for you coming down here. But if you hunt there's when the wind's blowing that way, they're not bedding here. They're going to be bedding someplace else, like a point over there that we'll look at. So they're going to be bedding here when the wind's blowing down here. So if it's blowing off a little bit, like, like say like this, we'll go over here. Blowing a little bit off like this, we're going to go over here. And I mean, you might find some stuff, like I noticed you said that you killed some good bucks out of here over here. You might eventually find some trails that drop through and go that way too and stuff. But I think the main setups you're going to find in a spot like this are going to be off on the edge of this ravine or off on the edge of that ravine. You know, you follow the edges of the point. So um, we're going to walk over here and look at this setup. Before we do that, anybody got any questions right about this bedding point here? You can hear crickets out there. <laughs> so the unique features to this would be just how narrow it is and how severe it drops around it would you say? I, th I think there's a couple unique features it's got a little more thickness I think it's got a distinct point I think it's a little more set back from the fields so the deer would feel a little safer here um, I think it can hold more deer so they you know more deer will be here or more community factor you know um, there's a lot of features to this that I like and I think it uh, when you get in here and you actually look at it it looks better than the other points around here which is why like I said before the best feature is going to hold the best box regardless of what it looks like well fortunately this looks good so it gives you the confidence too at least it looks good to me it's got historical rubs it's got fresh rubs um, you come running in here you don't see them right away but I mean if you stand in here looking around um, just about every tree that's rubbable I mean the one down there it's all scarred up you know look over here I see a fresh one look over there I see a scarred one Right. 
And, it, and if you look at how I look at a point and following the edges out, you'll see deer do the same thing. You'll follow rub lines right along that edge. So it's not like you won't know where the trail is. They'll leave sign that it's there if there's enough deer here to do that, right? Anything else? All right, so. A lot of times from, from the inside out or are you following, like if you're coming in to hunt this, are you gonna be scouting your way in until you feel like you found it and stop there? Or do you wanna come in, obviously you identified this as kind of like the location where you think the mature deer are probably bedding. Mm -hmm. So if I was coming in here to hunt and I've never hunted here before, never scouted it, I'd probably follow a ravine in with a, a just off wind until I felt I was getting close enough. And I'd probably be a little further back than when I need to because I wouldn't want to take the chance of blowing it out. But if I pre-scouted it, well then it's not an issue. You know, if I got in there at this time of the year and really looked at it, then I know where I gotta be. I marked it on my phone. I'm gonna go right to that spot. I know how to get in there. I, may, I marked an access. Um, so the pre-scouting is key, but you can hunt this stuff blind too. You just have to know how to read a map and be a little cautious about how to get into it, right? You'd be coming in backwards. So we're coming in from the deer's point of view out when I scouted in spring. If I'm scouting in season looking for a spot to hunt, I'm scouting from my point of view in. So then it's a little more iffy. You're taking guesses on where the deer are gonna bust you. Cause I wanna push it as far as I can to get those deer in daylight moving, you know? And I would certainly uh, promote that fully. But with that said, there's quite often a guy like myself who travels around and hunts a lot of public land, finds out about, here's a rumor, knows of a shed that was found or something, some giant wants to go after it. And he's going to a property he hasn't scouted. So then you gotta lay back on what you've learned when you actually looked at these points and went in here and pre-scouted and what you've seen and learned and then come in with that in mind and guess how close to come, right? And this case is nice because in spring, now we can scout our way back and we can think about, okay, where was that deer bedded? How far can I get? One thing you gotta keep in mind is there was beds up quite a ways up this hill. Good part is, is most of them were tending to be on this side a little bit. So I think on that side, you can get away with a little bit more closer, you know? So you gotta keep all that in mind. You know, you kick 20 deer off that hill, you might just blow this whole point and then your hunt's dead to begin with, right? Any other questions? You talked about kind of, I guess, going on the sides of, of this ridge, or this point. Mm -hmm. Are you working the same way out of the bed if it's, if your ag field, let's say this is an ag field down low versus ag field up high? Yeah, you know, I would probably follow them back from the bed to the ag, going, if they're dropping too. Um, how I set up might be a little different because of where the thermal rise. I might want to get beyond that thermal rise. It's harder to set up below. You got to get a little further back, I believe. Um, where I think up high is, is better. But uh, in some cases you do have deer dropping and then you, you have to set up that way. So sometimes they're not necessarily following the contour of the point and then dropping down. They might just drop straight off the end Correct. of the point. Correct. You, you do have to look at the sign. Uh, I think a lot of times with the, the fields on the top, they're traveling out like this. The fields on the bottom, a lot of times they just drop off the points. It gets a little harder with them dropping down. Um, going up to the fields is a better scenario, I think. It does kind of lead them the way that we're looking today. That's a good point. I didn't really think about mentioning that. Um, you're probably hunting something that has that scenario. Um, when the fields are in the bottom, they're just going to drop off the top. Yes. Or, or like in your case, the food's over there. They're not going to walk up there and walk around. They're going to drop over where you killed them. Yeah. And you said you killed some right on the point too? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the thermals are going to drop, mm -hmm. right? And you, let's say you got a cornfield down there, mm -hmm. <coughs> but you can't get so the cornfield's you know, too a, close. You, you can't get to rise. a flat spot. Mm -hmm. So your thermals are going to tend to go up. Mm -hmm. There's private land in that cornfield. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just try to get off wind a little bit. I would probably, uh, me personally, I would sit back and wait till the thermals are dropping, and then move in real quick. <coughs> So it'd be a really short window. Yeah, I gotta probably them. sneak in. Yep. In a low land. Right, it'd be a real short yeah. window, and I'd be close by waiting. I might even have a secondary stand where I'm sitting in a stand for a while until 
okay, the thermals are starting to drop, the sun's going down. Okay, get down and move over to the second stand, just so that you're in the area right when it happens, because this is a short window. You got to get over there pretty quick. I've done that and had it pay off, but it's it's not an easy task. I mean, and it's hard for some people to wrap their fingers around. A lot of guys are like they go out for a day of hunting. It's kind of hard to grab grasp your hand around hunting for a half an hour, you know. But that's what it takes sometimes for this in that scenario where you have to get into a window that is straight downhill from those deer. I don't have a flat spot. Correct. Really, you know. Yep. You know, a spot for the wind to settle. Right. right. Yep. Mm -hmm. so you're you not know. doing a lot of in-season scouting per se. Any of your in-season scouting, are you really just going into the stand on your back and your bow in your hand, scouting your way in and, and you know, season, finding that spot of, and not, you know. Yeah, that's how most of it is in-season. I don't, uh, I don't want to go and find it and come back a couple days later. Yeah, uh, like you've mentioned that. Yeah, especially on public, I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow that terrain in, find that setup, set up and hunt it. And if it don't work out, the next day I'm finding another spot like that and hunting it. And I'm just gonna keep moving uh, if it's not pre-scouted. Correct. But the day you find it is probably when you want to hunt it. So I'm scouting the stuff that the wind is already right for. If it's not right for it, I'm not scouting it that day. I'll go in the day the wind is right. Hey everybody, wanted to put a footnote in here that Dan kind of recommended me putting in here. Um, on this particular point, he wanted me to show that a lot of people set on the top of the point, kind of going out to the field in this scenario uh, at this spot. And that's a really an improper way of setting up in hill country. Most of the big deer are going to be uh, skirting around the corners of those points to go out into the fields to feed or wherever they're they're uh, going for uh, for the evening. Um, so I wanted to put that in here. You can see what I'm talking about here on this map. You can see a lot of people would set right here um, on the top of the point, and a lot of times you're not going to see the big ones come up that way. So just want to say that. So back to the video. Anything else? All right, let's follow this uh, contour out. Keep an eye on the, the rub line and how I'm following the rubs. Um, it's gonna be kind of hard for me to tell everybody what I'm looking at because we're all gonna be walking, right? So just, what I want you to do is look at how I'm following the rub line and then we'll stop where I'm gonna set up and I'll tell you why and how. So this is what I'm looking at the deer walking. I'm gonna walk right through here. I'm looking at all these rubs and the trails and. So the bed stopped out of sight now. They're around the corner. We're pretty close, but I think we're far enough back. And right here is where the trails start to split. Now they start going up in that way, coming down in here. And I think a guy could drop down from this field right here pretty easily, real quietly, and get up to this tree here. Come up the back side of it, have a stand up here, and be able to hit that trail, hit this side hill, get anything coming in and out of here, and have a fairly low impact. As long as he only did it a couple times a year, per se. Uh, timing is key, so it wouldn't be a bad idea to have a cell cam in here and with a big battery pack and leave it. Like say, uh, 50, 75 yards back, there was a tree falling over and all the deer had to come around this side of it. Right there, you'd have them narrowed down. Then you'd have a good idea when the deer's coming through here, right? Mm -hmm. But I think this would be my setup on this side right here. Uh, and I would probably, this time of the year, I'd probably clean out a path and I'd mark it so I get the right path. Um, you know, you tend to think I know this property real well and I'll walk into this no problem, but it all looks different when you come in here during the season and it's a pretty good idea to have the tree well marked. And uh, don't ask me how I know that. I ended up in the wrong spot a few times. But uh, I like this setup. I think it is aggressively close, but I think it's what you need to do to kill the real big one that lives here. Um, but again, I got to stress, you know, two, three times tops, probably two in a, in a season or you're being too aggressive. 
the rest of them you might want to be out towards the fields a little bit when you when you got a good idea that that buck's in here is when i'd be sitting here so this is again when the wind's blowing off like this oh well, it's coming down this way and now you get your thermal drops going to go right down this ravine pull it away from the deer a little bit in the evening when they come out and hang in here I like this a lot any questions about this you said knowing when they're in here right you need to try to use a camera cell cam or something that that well there's there's or? certain things that'll tip you off i mean um you're gonna start seeing rubs around the outskirts you're gonna start seeing deer coming from this direction when you're outside uh you get uh trail camera picture over the hill here coming from this direction just after dark you know a half hour after shooting hours you start to put two and two together um having a trail camera in here that's running year round on, on a cellular plan um, that would that would tip you off quite a bit that uh, they're in here right in daylight you might see that uh, there's a deer coming up here and it's getting it's shady light so you wait a little bit so the cell cam would help tremendously um but you can get you know quite a bit of money into running cell cams all over the place too and guys on public land really usually don't have that option or they lose them um anything else would this area be okay for a setup over here yep i think it could but it'd be kind of a long shot if they cross the ravine here and have to drop down so i like this spot right here because now i can shoot all this you know i can i can hit that trail i can hit this upper trail i think there's gonna be a good tendency from the stay up top up high here too and i think everything will be in range of this tree but i think if you get across that you're gonna have a lot of stuff that you're gonna see that's gonna be out of range and once you put a hunt in here i think deer kind of start catching on when you leave they start figuring out you're here so i think you got to make the first setup the right one and i think that's why i'm getting a little more aggressive and getting across the ravine to here because i can hit everything here and it's hit or miss you either kill it or you don't you know one time what would your access route be uh, right up from the field through here okay sure. This is a good point of there's a, I have a stand right up there, right at the bottom, you know, 75 yards straight up there. Sure. Not productive at all other than gun season. Mm -hmm. Like it's never productive for both seasons because they're always in here. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, through, I, I see them going, you can't tell what it is, you know, just the deer mm -hmm. going in there. But like I said, that one we use more for gun season because like I said, it's just not productive. It looks like it'd be a great. No, when you get in there early, <laughs> did the deer bust you down here? No. No, but you see them, you see them going through here. Like, okay. Uh, but but no, I wouldn't say they bust you. Mm -hmm. there's, there's just a lot of traffic in here, though. There really is a lot of traffic. I would imagine so. Yeah. Look based on the sign, and you, you know, and to go back on uh, your your question, um, that's one reason you know when the deer come through through history of seeing them at a certain yeah. time frame, yeah. traveling through. Um, that stuff tends to repeat itself. Oh yeah, for sure. And it can be not annually, but biannually too, because it can work on acorns and work on crops. But you tend to have certain time periods when they travel through an area or they bed in an area more often than others. And once you get that timing down, it seems to repeat itself year after year, almost to the date. Did you hunt this in the morning at all? Would I hunt it in the morning? Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, I guess that depends. Uh, the deer tend to, they, they tend to come in from the bottoms in the morning. And I might tend to try and find something more down low in a way um but this is far enough in the bedding they could come in from here and kind of meander down and around the beds and come back up into them and it is a good funnel so i think it could work during the morning too they found a spot yesterday really similar good bedding point mm -hmm. marked up on both sides coming up and the problem with it is the pro or the public ends before you could get it to any ditch or mm -hmm. any other crossing so it's basically just a point with two big side hills mm -hmm. and it's only bottom access you got to come up a ridge down another one and then that's where that ridge is i mean in, in the morning would you come up that side hill and try to come up kind of on that lee side of that hill with that wind blowing over yeah i, I would think that that's probably the only option you have right because yeah. if you get them in there in the evening you just blow everything out of there mm -hmm. in that scenario yeah. so i think yeah i'd try it uh, like on, on your land, no, here, if you had that camera running, you'd know morning or evening. Right. Because you'd see it on the camera. I would tend to think you'd see way better and more consistent uh, action right here during the evening. Yep. Um, but I'm not ruling out morning. I, I don't think it's that bad of an idea. And I think that you could, uh, 
you could give that a try because you don't have any other option in your scenario. And it's probably just like a one and done. You right. Go yeah. in there, go in or give her a shot. It and, and it might just be getting the timing down. That might be a good morning spot, especially around rut. They just go from bedding point to bedding point. You know, this might be a really good spot in the morning too during, you know, the last week of October, first week of November kind of thing. But at other times of the year, I even think like, uh, you know, opening week, this could be a good spot, a, a kill spot for a giant buck, you know. I don't know for sure, but if we put a camera here, we'd find out, you know, or if we threw a couple hunts at it. And, you know, when, when were you seeing the deer down in here? They tend to be evenings. What time frame of the year? Oh, I would say October. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty much all of October, if I'm up there, they're going across. Yeah. And then and then through gun season, really, all the way through November. I mean, they're, they're in I'd here. imagine based on that, that bedding area, it looks to me like it's uh, it might a be primary a bedding area. Yeah. So it's used year round. Yeah, that's, I would yeah. guess so. Mm -hmm. So I still think there'd be peaks when the biggest stuff is coming through here that's in the area. Sure. But it does look like it's year round used. Any other questions on this side? So you're picking this mainly just because it's out of sight? I mean, that's part of the reason from oh. that point? So I'm looking at those beds in the tip first, and I want to get out of sight, sound, and hearing, and just barely. Right. And at this point, I am out of it. I think maybe I wouldn't mind being a little bit further back, but I think I'm OK. But this is where all the trails start to split off and where it starts to get too wide to, 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 that you're not covering everything. Right here, you're covering every single thing. You're covering that trail cutting off that way, this whole side hill. I think this tree right here would be perfect. Would a rain day be better to get in or does it It might be. Um, your uh, leaves aren't gonna make noise in the rain. Um, get in a little quieter, get in a little closer. When you're pushing the envelope like this, wind and rain are your friends because they, uh, they stop deer from hearing or seeing you. The wind will move stuff around. And like, like, let's say there's one bedded on this hill that can see you. And this is windy in here. They're a lot less likely to see you moving. Like if your head picks up over the top a little as you come up here or something, they're much less likely to pick that up. So yeah, those days are better. You ever find yourself getting kind of greedy to, to cover all the trails and then you end up getting busted? Like I, I've, yeah, Had I mean, it happen many not, times. If you're not taking chances that get you busted every now and then, yeah. you're not getting close enough and you're probably not killing good stuff. I know a lot of people that uh, tell me they see big bucks all the time and they never kill them. They're always just out of range. They're just over here. They're just over. I don't have that problem. I see them, I kill them. Because they come into where I can kill them because I push that envelope real close. But in the same light, every now and then I'm halfway up a tree and I see a giant rack jump off and I'm throwing my boat on going, damn it. I'm an idiot, I'm never doing this again, but then the next time I go out and do that and I kill him, you know? So, you, you, you gotta get mad and swear a little in order to kill him. I think that these are animals that you have to push that envelope with in order to kill mature ones on a regular basis. I'll be fine then, because I swear at them a lot. Yeah. <laughs> then you're doing good. Yeah, swearing. <laughs> That's a good trait. <laughs> when shit hits the fan, you know, during the rut, how much are you waiting, you know, let's say known doe bedding areas, and are you considering tweaking your setup based on those those areas? Uh, I'm going day by day. Uh, I'm almost always uh, hunting pinch points by bedding areas, even during rut. Um, but I'll tend to look at doe bedding a little, little harder. Usually come around the last uh, week of October into uh, November, you know. I mean, in this specific setup, just to me, this is pretty steep for doe bedding. I mean, just over that edge, I can see some does. And if you have a mature buck coming from that bed, he might skirt just, just that downwind side of it. And I mean, that's a pretty pretty far poke. Would you consider going up, you know, say 15, yeah, I, 20 yards? I probably wouldn't unless I've seen that because I would tend to think that they're going to eventually yeah. going to end up here. That, that would be my scenario. I think that you're going to get deer that go some way you don't, don't want them to go, that they do go up by the does. But I tend to think if they chase that doe around, that doe's going to come running right through here. I mean, it's this is the channel. So if I was seeing that on a consistent basis or I thought that that was, I, I would tweak my setup. And occasionally I am wrong. I mean, we all are, right? And we do end up moving a setup. But I do think that this looks to me like this is the setup. And this is where I would be. And even during rut, I think that they would still come through this particular window. This spot reminds me of a 
<coughs> spot that I have on some private, but to touch on the morning comment too, I when I first saw this, that was my first question to Dan was like, is this a morning or an evening spot? But um, we talk about thermals dropping in the evenings and stuff, but I mean, if I'm gonna get two or three sits on this, one of them's gonna be around that, you know, the last couple of days of October, first part of November. And I'm probably gonna come in here, me personally, I'd come in here right <laughs> at sun up. And I'm gonna probably set up in here in the morning because it's it's south facing the sun's this is going to warm up pretty pretty quickly compared to everything else around it i personally feel i can get in here during that time set up and get you know that three four hour window in the morning especially when those bucks are going to be going through here and i almost feel like this is a <coughs> bullet from, from that standpoint and i love the access to it too from how we he gets up and how you get up here it's a pretty easy slip in here yeah, and, sure. and you really don't even impact the deer trails no, you get no. to here and not touch anything no. so jared what time are you talking to get you <clears throat> I, I i mean i'd be coming in just nice and slow and try not to disturb anything but and set up but it's it's right at sun up and it's even if you're a little bit late it feels it feels wrong initially because it goes against everything that you think but during that time of the year that's when i'm this far off the field you know that eight to ten in the morning, eleven in the morning is when I see those bigger deer using this kind of terrain with the bedding, and then when you can use that sun, like if I was on the other side of this, it's in the shade all day. I've set up similarly going there in the morning, and it's a train wreck because your your thermals and stuff are dropping and it's swirly girly in there. But here, I just feel like you could almost be as long as you had sun, it would have to be a clear morning. I think cloudy would be tough in here, but with a clear morning, you could. You could get away with a lot of stuff in here, personally. I think you could pr pretty much hunt it all day because I think in the evening when you start to drop for evenings, you're going to go right down to ravine and they're already placed. <clears throat> so when they come off, they come through. But I think, uh, I think you're right. This would be a, a great spot for that. I mean, you could uh, get away with a lot here. I think you could even push this like three times a year or, or something because you're not getting your scent in here all over these trails or anything. You're just getting to this tree, you know, and, and that's it. Have the setup done at this time of the year and just leave it sit there the whole the whole year till hunting season. So you're waiting for sun up because you got that thermal pole, so you're essentially getting in with that wind going right up to the field because of that thermal. Right, there. you can come in here at dark, <coughs> but then if something comes through, you're coming right down. Awesome right. Yeah. right, if you're coming into bed in the dark, yeah. they bust you. At that time of year, that's what I'm trying to capture is a buck coming back late and yeah. taking advantage of that yep. upward thermal. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Anything else? A lot of chainsaw work in that ditch, but that you could you could literally just about run that ditch all the way in. Yeah, mm -hmm. and not har hardly nothing. You could probably just drop around that stuff too. If you'd be low enough. Sure. If you're gonna climb the tree, anyways, you know, just but right here you'd have to do some work to get a, get through to it. But uh, you do that this time of the year and. You make sure the trail's marked enough that you get to the right tree without you end up over there and go, where was the tree? And walk back, you know. So you guys want to look at the other side? We'll go back to the point and then we'll walk out to the, the other point and look at how we'd set up on the other side. And not to be redundant, but I think it's good to look at how you'd set up on two sides of this point. And uh, we can look at the maps when we get back too and, and uh, see what it looks like on a topple. I think it'd be kind of cool. So let's walk back up to the point, and then from there we'll go look at the other side. Um, I like this setup right here. I mean, it's a pretty steep drop all the way over there until you get right here where I think they can cross. I like this. Um, I think there's obviously some deer going through right in here. I can see a trail going through. Um, but I can also see some rubs going up further that way along here. I think this area right in here would be the good setup where you can shoot this little area where it's a good crossing. And uh, you can still hit the side hill. And I think you're plenty far enough back from the bedding. So I would probably be in this tree like right here. If the thermal drop down into here. Uh, you'd have to have kind of a wind going like this, which means you'd have to get them pretty quick before they got over here. Um, I might not exactly be in that tree based on the exact wind of the day. I'd probably come in here and kind of check the wind, figure out exactly where I wanted to be. 
But this is about where I'd be for how far back off of the point on this side. And I would have a setup over here and a setup on the other side if I was if I was hunting this. Um, any questions? No, maybe it's wind dependent, but there are like a bunch of beds that we walked past to, including a few big ones. I don't know if it's uh, you know more that's more on this wind where it's coming over. Or... Yeah, I th it. There were some beds over there. I don't know if they're big buck beds. I think the bigger buck beds were towards the point because you could see the rubs around them. But uh, there certainly was some satellite bedding <coughs> up in here. That's you're kind of around the corner here. I think you got to be careful getting in here. But uh, it's a little aggressive. But it's I think it's the spot you need to be in to to cover this end. Do you typically see movement over here? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I was saying the one there, there's another kind of almost the same thing repeating around the next corner. Mm -hmm. So they're coming around that way. Now that stand is, morning is pretty good mm -hmm. down there. And like I said, but you'll see them even if you're, like I said, just walking through the edge of the field at a random time of day, you see movement down in here, like a lot. Now, right. now interesting, you said that that's a good morning spot. Now do you see the deer coming around to get into this point from down below at all in the morning? Yeah, they're, they're a lot. They're down in the very bottom a lot in the morning. Yeah. Like, yeah. So that's what I see typically is they come up from the bottoms in the morning to get up to the tops. Mm -hmm. You know, when you start getting into the rut, that's when you get more of them running this stuff in the mornings up higher. Yep. But earlier in the season, you're going to see a lot more of that coming in from the bottom to the top because they're going to be more wind specific about exactly where they bed, where they're a little more worried about the does come rut that are up up on the top here, that are up higher than their beds. You guys are a quiet group. Yeah. Shy or what? Yeah, right. Any more questions? Thought this would take a little longer with questions and talking. So um, we got one other uh, bedding area we can look at over the hill. I, I think uh, that'd be good. Just yeah. a little tiny bedding knob over there. That looked pretty good to me when we walked it. It's covered in snow. All right, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and fast forward the video to where we go to Eric's property. The next spot on here is a little bit monotonous. It's kind of the same setup as what you're seeing um, on this particular spot Dan was uh, talking about in this portion of the video. So I'm gonna skip over to Eric's, got some unique uh, bedding areas on that farm. So get back to the video. So I found uh, this spot really interesting. Uh, Eric pointed it out to me when, uh, when we were up here uh, last week, I think. Um, but uh, we always talk about deer bedding, watching our axis and stuff. And uh, do you want to point out the bedding area here? Yeah, so you'd never really look at it from down here and say, okay, who wants to hunt right here? Well, the reality of it is if you look at this, this is sort of a uh, like a three, four tiered spine that goes up, joins a nice field crossing on the back side where the deer naturally come out of the other block of timber, cross in and hit this. You'll see as we walk up the little road here, there's just tons of little points and beds all the way around this thing. And these deer, I will physically go in here probably in the next month or month and a half, and I will pin a bunch of cell cams on these points and just leave them for the year. Literally just leave them. And over the years what I've learned is, is literally that point right there, there's always a 150 to 180 inch deer that beds right there and he spends his time right there and on that next point typically and after a while after seeing we've killed some of them so they're gone and done and pretty soon it gets, it gets replaced by another mature buck and after a while you start to wonder why the hell and, and we've got people in and out of here non-stop there's cars and trucks and people out here you know doing whatever they do almost every day of the year and them deer are comfortable laying right there just because when we get up there you'll see it because it overlooks the whole thing it's just an access spot where if we're just down here doing our thing, they're cool being there. But as soon as we start heading up that direction, they got an out, you know, three, four different directions they can head out. So they, I think they feel good about it. A lot of the wind currents, this is a big valley, um, a lot of swirling. We'll have a predominant wind outside, you know, we'll say in the flats. And in here, it's completely different because it's all valleys. And just about everybody knows that hunting in valleys is sometimes really really tough because nothing's consistent 
there, there's a few tricks and things that you can do to curb that, but you never fight it. It just, it never made no sense to me until probably two, three years ago, I started realizing that the biggest deer that, that I've got around here, which ain't always a, a giant, and some people are hunting for hot dogs and some are hunting for antlers, so it's, you know, two different worlds, but the point up here that we'll see later, and these two points here are within 150 yards of all my buildings and all my activity and everything else, they're still probably the best I have. We talk about how uh, how the deer bed in places where people don't go. Well, they bed really close to where people go, but not where people go. So that's just fine as long as he's moving around down here. Like you said, if you move up that direction or up that hill, then they have a problem with it. But this kind of sets in stone how close those deer can be to people and to their axes and stuff. Really those overlooked spots don't have to be that far from people, they just have to be overlooked. They could be right next to a parking lot, they can be right next to an access trail. They just have to be where the people aren't going to hunt. You know, like if you hunted up on that hill, and you put a stand up there and you hunted there, say five times a year, what do you think would happen? They'd move. I don't know, Dan's one of the only guys I ever heard say it, and I've never really said it out loud, but I do it. It's the dumbest places that people overlook and the dumbest setups that work the best for me. Now it's different on every property, I suppose. Your pressure, yeah. you know. We uh, call it the fat chicks uh, spot because. Right, uh, I don't want no one to see me doing it. Right. Uh, but I'm showing all these people. <laughs> I, I don't want anybody here, to, I want everybody here to see it. But when you got 30 tons of M&Ms, you see some weird <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. let's just head up there and then we can wait on the questions until after you see it because no. I think the questions will be more refined after yeah. we see it. All right. so. them, two, them deer, what, what they'll do is they'll just sit here and when I would get aggressive or, or just ignorant and just pop in there, well, they just seen me coming. Now I will tell you that the cameras have showed me a lot that if I take off walking down through here, whether I'm on a bike or walking or whatever I'm doing, if I just go, they don't leave. They don't booger. They don't care. But now if I was going to be aggressive and try to pop into this blind, I won't see that deer again that day. Not about no chance. Now what if you had a blind just uh, 20, 30 yards past that and you went past and came through the trees to it? I'd probably get away with it, but the problem with the scenario is you can't see it from here, but around on the other side of them pines is another setup exactly the same as this one. Oh. It's a duplicate, so it's both sides. So if you did that, it'd, it'd probably work for over here, but you'd be I'd blowing bust that, that one. Out. Right, mm -hmm. right. And I always felt good about coming in this backside on this spine up here when I knew there was nothing here that I had to worry about because I'm not hurting that. I also so you could literally that hunt that and then hunt this. Yep. And you're hunting this and then that. Essentially, most likely them deer are going to filter back along this ridge and cross these spines at some point anyway. Mm. So it, it is. You could get impactful and try to get in the middle of them. Uh, they're both going to see you. That one there, you're probably a little more sheltered. You'd be able to get in. And we've done that a lot, late season especially, if we don't have the deer bedding here that we're concerned about. They're either here or they're there most likely. So if they're not here, we have slipped into this blind. We've shot some crazy good deer out of that blind, and you never think it, but... You know, I once had a, a guy tell me that uh, I ruined his hunting because when I taught him how to read beds and how to read terrain and stuff, he said that now there's so much stuff I can't hunt where before I just stumble in there and hunt, and every now and then you get lucky, but now you look at it where the deer are bedding and stuff, and it's so tough. And this is one of those spots where, man, this is hard to kill a deer out of something mm -hmm. like this. It is. You got to be patient. And you got to be willing to not hunt it too. Mm -hmm. You have to literally be, just admit that it ain't going to happen maybe. Yeah, or you know like let's say a lot of these guys are in a public realm. You can come and you find something like this near a parking lot or behind a factory or something where you can hunt and you're like well how do I hunt this? Well you, you know what you start out by just throwing a stand out there and doing what you think. And maybe it works, maybe it don't. And I wouldn't doubt it, uh, you haven't said nothing to me about it, but I wouldn't doubt it if the first hunt or two you did this wrong. Oh, you tweak it. I know I did. You got to tweak it over time and Absolutely maybe you ruin it for wrong. a season or something. But you ain't going to get anywhere by just being too conservative and not trying some things and figuring some things out. 
I think that everybody would rather hunt and not have a successful hunt mm -hmm. than never hunt again. It's part of the, it's, you, it's you know, it's a successful it. hunt if you're learning something, right. if you're getting something out of it. Yeah, and you know, most most good hunters are the people that enjoy the hunt whether they see a deer or not. Mm -hmm. It's not always about the kill. Now well, granted, that's what we're in it for, and I want it. I want it every time I go, but I don't expect it. Hell, I'm happy to kill one a year. That's all I hope for. So I think we should pop up to that next rise right there. And that's that's amplified 10 times over this spot, but it's the same scenario, just kind of a little more aggressive, a little bit better spot. Spot where I'm gonna put a cell in somewhere on these trees back here and try to cover. There's a real primary bed right here and the other being right here. <coughs> They do hit this once in a while, but it seems like I think they much prefer these two spots. And usually if I can cover these two spots, I feel like I've got 90% of this point covered, if that's all I can see. Kind of the same scenario. We got the same same view. It's just backed off a little bit. They're a little bit further from the danger. I find that the bigger deer, the four, five, six-year-old deer, they're gonna prefer it up here than down there. The three-year-olds and younger in does is what I see down here more often. I think this is just, what, 70 yards? 70 yards down the hill? Mm -hmm. They feel that much better about being yeah. backed off just yeah. a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it's still a pretty aggressive spot for deer to bed, but on the other side of the coin, I think it's, I mean, they got plenty of escape routes, whether it's right up the spine or off down through that valley or that valley. So, yeah, I mean, you just kind of look around and, think about it and you can see everything they can hear well up here they can smell a fair amount up here so I, that's why I've come to the consensus that's why they like these two points so much so how do you hunt it? the cell cam if it ain't uh, if it ain't showing me on a cell cam if there's a deer that I don't even consider this a hunting spot until I see a deer in here that I want to target once I start seeing him here until I see him do something whether he slips off that edge of the ridge or he comes off this other way goes up the spine whatever it is that's when I'll come in and this, this spine right here that comes down I'll typically have a stand I believe it's uh, it's one of the trees basically 15 20, I'd say 20 yards down that spine and that's just another rolling hill on the backside but they travel if they do come from that that hillside over here typically you're going to come up one side or another that's fine anything that's going to come and come back through here in bed i typically catch them coming down the hill that's typically what they'll do is they'll run that side hill there's a lot of points and bedding up here they're typically going to shave that off you can see the main trail that comes right up down the spine so that's typically when i see them gone i'm going to slip up the back side i do catch them coming down to that little pond right there a lot and we just dug that in. This is a little water hole because they're dead up here. They feel safe slinking down through here, grabbing a drink in the middle of the day. Sometimes they'll come back to um, Essentially, I don't touch this spot unless I got intel from a camera that tells me to. So do you come in uh, before daylight and get up on that spot? I've done that a bunch and that works pretty good. Actually, that's probably the best because what happens is, is when these deer are off, not back to the bed yet in the morning, Oftentimes they're going to be there's a big field up here. They're feeding up here or A lot of times they're down in this bottom in the clover And if I can get in and slip around this back side and get in here before them It is a good morning setup. The problem is is what I run into Is when they start coming off that top field and my thermals start rising Typically they're going to follow the contour of that hill mm -hmm. as long as they're on that spine. I'm good If I got too stiff of a breeze that's pushing where, where they're going to hit that spine i can't shoot them before they get to that spine is the problem just because of the way the contour of the hill is they have to come off that hill in order for me to be able to shoot but what i've seen is most of them deer in the morning don't feed back down this spine it's more of a travel corridor during the rut when they're chasing and crossing from one wood block to another they just follow that wooded fence line but when they're naturally coming off these fields they're usually funneling there's a almost like a bench that wraps around that whole bowl. And they'll usually come off that field and walk that bench around and stay on the low side. So my thermals, by the time they push around, 
in the morning time I got to be very conscious of that in the afternoon they drop I'm no worry I'm no concern in that stand it's just all the stars have to align it's like buying a pull tab and expecting everyone to win they're not it's just one of them things where you you hope you get lucky eventually and hit the right situation so it's not a primary spot I don't I don't key on it I don't expect to use it there's plenty of years I don't I don't even hunt up there not one time and if the situation's right well then I'm gonna do it that's essentially really all this spot is so I thought it was just kind of a neat place because of the being so close to the buildings but yet there's everything they want so I thought it was something good to point out so anybody got any questions about this here's a silly question and I wouldn't typically do this but say the cover for a trail camera having a tree or a post or something like that what do you guys think of that Say versus being on a tree, having it on a post or something in that order, a camera for spooking or just well, it depends on where you put the camera. Um, I probably personally wouldn't get this aggressive with a, a cell cam. Um, my cell cam would be near here, but not in the beds. I just got a tendency to every time I put them in the bedding areas, and maybe it's the brands I've used or whatever, but uh. The, when I put it up, I start getting all kinds of pictures of deer walking into the bedding area looking at the camera and then leaving. But if I put it on an entrance coming in or an exit going out, I get more just common movement patterns. But they seem real... Um, camera shy? Camera shy right in a bedding area. Um, but if I'm out on a food source or something, I have no problem putting it on a pole. Sometimes I, I go to like... Uh, believe it or not yard sales and twice as nice stores and stuff like that and I buy tripods like cheap ones whenever I see them they'll be two three bucks and I use those like in cattail swamps and stuff I can set them up I can screw it up to wherever I want it they work really nice and you can get them cheap and just about every one of those used place stores has those has tons of them for three or four bucks nobody buys them and uh, I buy a lot of those for doing that um, but that don't work in a spot like this they'd recognize that tripod right away the only way you'd get away with it here is maybe putting it up into a tree higher and if it doesn't make any noise you might get away with it and, and i i personally would not put a post or a pick and stick or anything here just be i've seen the bigger the deer the worse it is it seems mm -hmm. but if they see the can i had a deer back in 2017 or whatever it was and he's by far the biggest deer I'll ever hunt in my life. And that deer, I would get a picture of him every time I knew where he lived and I was pretty on him. And I would get a picture of him, maybe two, and then all of a sudden, nothing for a couple days. And after a couple days, you're thinking, oh, you know, did he move on? Did somebody kill him? What happened? Well, you'd place a new camera somewhere in the area or something like that, boom, two days of pictures of him. He was a camera shy deer and he would pick out cameras. I tried brushing them in, I hit them, I did everything I could. Short of what I do nowadays, that tree right there is gonna be my tree that I'm gonna put the cell cam in. I'm gonna go up with two sets of climbing sticks. I'm gonna put two sticks up and I'm gonna hang that camera way up there. Um, I feel like my cameras are no, no or I don't wanna say no noise because I don't know if that's a thing, but very, very, very little noise and it's not enough at that distance to intrude on him. I don't feel like that camera up there at 10 feet or 12 feet, whatever I put it, I don't feel like that's hurting him, but you're 100% right. Deer, smart deer especially, are so camera shy. Once they pick it out, they don't like it. It's not normal. That's not something that should be there. You can, you can tell on your setups too that if that's happening, because you'll get pictures of the big buck just like locked into the camera you know, 100%. you're getting pictures like that i mean he might go back to normal but if he looked at that camera he noticed it he noticed it and he knew it wasn't supposed to be there and he don't like it if you got if your pictures the deer aren't paying no attention to the camera you're doing it right but then here's the next thing you hear that yeah. you know what that is a neighbor, a neighbor. <laughs> that that is a neighbor and those guys and you guys are probably not in that crowd nice people and all but they live and die by that thing and I don't care where I'm at I can be on the other side of my place and I hear them start it up I hear where they're going to and I can tell you within a hundred yards of what tree they're sitting in when they stop because I know every place they go because that's what they do they do it all year 
they push these deer and they push these deer. They start hunting an opening day of season and they don't stop until it's over. Every day, five, six of them. Well, you know what? Within two weeks of the season opening, you know what they've done? Gave me a whole load of deer to harbor because they learn. And uh, I ain't saying four wheelers ain't nice because I don't like walking up that hill either. I also like killing deer. So I'm going to probably Deer can skip. hear that just the same as me and you. They hear it better than me and you. Mm -hmm. And they know it. I mean, some people say, oh, they get used to it. Yeah, they might not get up and run when they hear it, but they sure as hell ain't going nowhere near it. I, I hunted on a, on a property where the landowner told me that uh, he uses an ATV to access all the stands because he's got the deer used to it. He's got an access trail, and those deer know that access trail, and they hear that ATV every day, so they're used to it. Mm -hmm. And I sat in a tree out there, and I watched him drive by to go to his hunt, and watched deer come out of the bedding point, walk to the edge, and stare at him till he parked, got off, watched where he went, and then walked back into the bed. I literally watched it. I got it on film. It was amazing to me to watch that. We don't give them enough credit sometimes. Right. You know, you think in some gonna... ways we make them into Einsteins that they're not, and yeah. in other ways we don't give them enough credit. They can hear, just like we can. It's a pretty simple critter overall. I mean, it's all about survival. And if you know the enemy's there, do you want to go there? Or do you want to go the other way? Mm -hmm and that's why you hope you're on the other end of that but it's just coincidental that that's going on but it's it's a common thing i'm not a big fan of it i love that a neighbor does it i don't so anything else is that the property line right there where they it's up top yeah so if that buck gets you right there then what do you do if he what if he ended up stinging you on that camera? Yeah, or on that, if you set up there to sneak in on Risk you take. I mean, it, it, did you booger him bad enough that he's moving on, or is he just like, I think you said it earlier, does he not know what happened? That might not even be a bad air, idea. I mean, sometimes a spot like this ain't worth, ain't, ain't uh, you, you don't it. hunt it just to uh, it's a fall kill back. a deer. You come in here because you got to keep those deer honest. If he beds here all season, how are you going to kill him? So if he's bedding here constantly, you don't take a shot at him. Because you don't want you don't think you can kill him here, and you don't want to push him off the property. What happens if you do bump him? I mean, is he going to go over by the high pressure neighbors? Is he going to go out of? The, he's probably not going to go out of the country. He probably beds other spots real close by, and maybe the bedding area over here where he kills his buck. You know, um, I've got areas over by me like uh, there's one one uh, spot. Well, it's literally a swamp. It's not hill country, but there's an island that's a good got a good bedding point on it. And uh, you can go out there and randomly see deer on occasion, but I've learned that if I take a walk around that whole perimeter of marsh and kick all the deer in there, and I, I don't do that the day I'm gonna hump, I do it like the day before, and then the next day go in there and hunt, I have a hell of a hunt. Because all the deer move into I the slump, there. now there's only one bedding area they can bed. Now out here, you could be kicking them onto your neighbors, but if you've got the best bedding areas and the best food, those deer usually have a smaller home range than what people give them. I mean, it might be on your neighbors, but it might be here too. But uh, just keeping them honest, I mean, you can't just let them sit up here and bed free for the whole season.